I'm curious, are you a dog person or a cat person? So Scott, I know that you probably have a really good answer to this one is, you know, if you had to choose or if you are, you know, which one it would be your preference, your cat person or a dog person? Ooh, well, that's a, that is a great question. So personally, I love dogs. Uh, dogs make me smile when walking down the street and they're in my neighborhood. I like to greet all the neighborhood dogs. Um, however, professionally cats um, are, are, are very high on my list. I, um, prior to being a, a, a biologist here at the museum, I was a a zookeeper uh, at the San Diego Zoo for, for many years. And um, there I worked a, a cat string, a string of cats uh, for several years at one point. Um, and I took that, those interests and I got scars all over my hands from all the times I was bitten. Um, but um, so here at the museum, um, because of our relationship uh, with the zoo, uh, my former relationship with the zoo, I, I get everything we're first on the list for anything that dies there. Yeah. And so and that sounds gross and disgusting. And it, and sometimes it's really rough on me because I worked with a lot of the animals that we end up getting here at the museum, but it, we're first on the list. And so I have first pick. And so as a result, our cat collection here at the museum is terrific. I can see um, that you're like torn in between. Like, oh, <laughs> personally, you, I could see you walking up to, to the neighborhood dogs and just getting in their face and letting, mm -hmm. you know, really interacting with them. <laughs> but at work, it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's a feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, the dogs are fun and cats are super interesting to me. Um, and so, yeah, no, we've got... Results too. What's that? And our poll results, I think Emily just posted those. Yeah, yeah. Emily. Yeah. So we have here at the museum, most of the big cats of the world. I think all we're missing is the tiger. So we've got leopard, snow leopard, cheetah, mountain lion, um, uh, 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 jaguar. Um, and that's the story that I'd like to push into real quick. So the, the um, jaguar macho bee, um, if you look up that name, you'll, you'll find many, many stories on it. So the jaguars are um, normally from South America, Central America, and then they've been pushing into the United States periodically. And uh, one of them was coming up into Arizona, and this was about 15 years ago, and it was just well watched on motion cameras, and uh, it was just it was very interesting. And um, and then through some mistakes and old age, the animal died. Um, so I, I, I recommend looking it up. It's a sad story, but it's actually a really interesting story. And so I had a relationship with a biologist from Arizona Game and Fish, and I called him up and said, you know, hey, I love that animal. And he laughed at me because the Smithsonian wanted it, the Field Museum wanted it, the British Museum of Nat everybody wanted it. And here's, you know, the little San Diego Natural History Museum. But this friend had worked in our collection and knew how terrific we cared for our collections and how great a shape they are. And he said, you know, I'll put a good word in for you, but there's no way you're going to get it. And so the next day I got a call from the head of Arizona Game and Fish. And, and it, was, it was really a cool call. Um, and she just said, you know, I'd like to give you this cat. And, and I asked, you know, why? <laughs> in comparison to all these other great people. Uh, other great organizations. And she said that, you know, during her um, uh, period between her, uh, after her master's degree, she was looking for something to do. And she had been volunteering here at our museum, in our department, you know, and this was like wow. 10 years prior. Yeah. And uh, she had worked with Phil Unit, and Phil Unit was the impetus for her going on to getting her PhD. She convinced, he convinced her to do it. She loved all the work he was doing. And as a result, she was head of Arizona Game and Fish at that point in time as a result. Yeah. So I could talk about Macho B for hours and hours and hours. But the story, the other part of the fun part of the story is, is I was crossing the border because it's, um, you know, fully protected species. Even crossing a state border is, you know, presenting paperwork, et cetera. And as I was crossing from Arizona to California with it, I had it in the back of my truck. 
and a drug sniffing dog, I got stopped at one of the border patrols points and the drug sniffing dog absolutely freaked out. And the handler didn't know how to react, you know, because there was this, <laughs> the dog was scared to death, obviously, because it never encountered such a smell in the back of my truck. Wow. Yeah, I could just imagine and see the, the visualization of the dog just almost wanting to just run away from the truck as fast mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, thank you so much for joining us today. We are we're thrilled to have Scott um, share a little bit about his his story of how he got to the museum. Um, we do have a Q&A section for our feature here. So if you have any questions that you're dying to ask Scott or you want to know more about as we're going through the, uh, this member meetup, we can definitely filter those uh, and funnel them into, uh, to Scott so he could try to get those best as answered as possible as best as he can to you. Uh, but thank you again for joining us. We are thrilled to have Scott share a little bit more. And he briefly talked a little bit about kind of how he got started with the museum. But is there anything else? Because I know a lot of times when we've talked to some of our scientists, Scott, is that they always say, talk about volunteering. And that's how they, they, they got their start at the museum. Can you share a little bit about that you know, behind the scenes story of what led to you working with where you're at now? Yeah, that, that actually, Hector, that's a great question. Um, and I understand there might be some students on this uh, on this uh, talk today. So uh, volunteering is imperative. Um, I did a lot of it back then, and it's even more so now is to gain that real experience. Back then, it was a lot easier job easier to get a job as a biologist. You know, this I'm talking back then, like late 80s, 90s. So quite a ways back then. Um, so as as I was working at the zoo, I volunteered here at the museum. So the zoo was wonderful for animal handling, but I didn't feel like I was having an impact on conservation or really doing anything that was, you know, someday I'm going to die and I want a legacy. And and um, and I just didn't feel that that was the, the route, the right route for me uh, that was going to be fulfilling. So I volunteered here. I had some skill sets learning how to prepare animals at um, from San Diego State. And so I brought those over here and slowly, we didn't have a mammologist then, slowly became the expert. And, and I started getting contracts and then I started getting invited on expeditions and here we are now, you know, doing wonderful things. We have lots of grants and contracts and we just, you know, I get to travel many different wonderful places. You know, I probably sleep in my own bed six months of the year. Otherwise I'm, you know, in the back of my truck or on a cot or on the ground somewhere or in a cheap hotel. Um, that's, you know, so yeah. And I love what I'm doing now. Um, uh, I. I'm very fortunate. I look forward to coming to work every day. And when I was at the zoo, no, it just became a routine. And so every day is very, very different for me. And literally, I'll come in seven days a week sometimes, very, very often. Well, that's a different story from different departments across the museum. So I'm, I'm working from home for the most part. I know with, the, with COVID, that's been a lot of things for, where people's work schedules have shifted, but I could just imagine yours is like, it's always been, it's always been, you know, not said, it's always going around sleeping, like you said, sleeping on the floor or in the truck or on a cot somewhere out in the field. Um, and so, and you briefly talked about the big cats. And I think you said that we have the biggest collection, world collection of big cats. Can you share a little bit about the, you know, what is the importance behind having a collection that is maybe not just native to uh, specimens here in our region? And what is the importance of that? Well, you know, a, a very current story, well, somewhat current story is um, uh, years ago, several years ago, <laughs> the, the, I'll make sense of that being current. Um, several years ago, um, I was offered one of the bison at Camp Pendleton. So there's a um, bison or non-native to San Diego. Um, and there was an introduced herd in the middle of Camp Pendleton, a really important herd uh, because they're genetically distinct. They're, they haven't been bred with cattle. Um, and it, unfortunately, they live in a bombing range and one of them got hit and it was still in good enough shape. And so I took it. Um, and so processing it to a, um, a full skeleton is important. So 
um, I took that animal and it takes usually about a year for an animal that big to go from bloody mess to, to a complete white skeleton, um, sometimes more, uh, like if we're doing a whale, it's two years. And so um, I took that animal, uh, processed it completely. And right as it was uh, at completion, um, Tom Demeray from our paleontology department had uncovered a fossil bison at the intersection of Highway 76 and 15 when Caltrans was redoing the roadway. And so um, having these specimens that, um, from, uh, that are not from our region are ap very applicable to um, uh, other scientists in many ways as well as, so that, that's a paleontological application, but people from all over the world come and take um, either genetic samples or come to look at the skulls and take measurements all the time of, um, of, all, of all of what's in our collection. We do, the majority, the vast majority of our collection is from this region, San Diego, Baja, et cetera. Uh, but I like to keep a small uh, collection representative of worldwide mammals. Um, that also can be used for teaching. So, um, so the, 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 the current uh, is that Tom Demeray also, just this last couple of weeks, it was on the news that a bison was found in Mission Valley. Uh, I don't know any details other than that. Maybe, maybe you guys, uh, Hector, Emily, uh, Ewan might know more, but um, uh, so again, we have a good representation. And so as he pieces those things back together, he'll take the bones from this perfectly intact uh, current uh, bison and uh, apply it to what he's finding, which often is just in pieces. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's definitely something that I, I think about right now is you talked about, you know, big felines and, and, and big mammals. And is, has there been a time, I know that you, that you work really closely and I know that you have a really good connection to the San Quentin kangaroo rat. And that's a really relatively smaller one specimen is smaller uh, to our to our region and I could just see you know how different is it when you're working with big specimens and working with you know the different large mammals that we have to the smaller ones like how can you share a little bit about your uh, like how that came about where you uh, your story behind the San Quentin kangaroo rat? So the San Quentin kangaroo rat we stumbled into it um, just trapping on my way south uh, to southern Baja and um, working in the San Quentin Plains. And it's really important to know, look it up on a map, the San Quentin Plains is um, uh, a coastal region of, of uh, Baja California. It's several hours south of Ensenada. And it's been almost entirely converted to agriculture. And that's been going on for about 80 years now and um, hitting its peak in the eight, 1980s, uh, 1990s, uh, where they were drawing groundwater, extensive groundwater to water these agricultural fields. And almost all the habitat was uh, taken away for these agricultural fields. And um, thus affecting uh, all the wetlands of the area. Many of the wetlands are just completely gone uh, or decimated or bulldozed over. Um, but that kangaroo rat somehow persisted at these edges. Um, and it was thought extinct in the early 1990s. And I just stumbled across it. And not a lot of people have experience um, with these kangaroo rats. And they're just slightly different than our local kangaroo rat, um, you know, maybe 20, 30% larger. And that's, that's hard to, if you haven't held a thousand of them, you're not going to know. And I immediately knew that, oh, wow. This this is not this is not San Diego or Southern California's kangaroo. Rat. This is the San Quentin kangaroo rat, and it just it lit off a firestorm. And you know we we've been studying it for several years. And there's a graduate student now working on his PhD out of uh, Cicese and in Ensenada now working on it. So it's a it's a wonderful project, and it it's a it's a really big issue in in Mexico now. Is is groundwater. Um, you know, just just emptying it. And so the problem is right now in San Quentin is that they're building desalinization plants. Mm -hmm. And so what was happening is these fields were becoming fallow. 
um, meaning they, they just weren't using them anymore because they took up all the groundwater and the kangaroo rats found their way back in. So if you can think of a checkerboard, they, you know, they checkerboard their way all around San Quentin again. So they came back in huge numbers. We found them all over the place, wow. it, like right next to the city where a field hadn't been worked in 10, 15 years because there wasn't enough water. And so wow. it's a really cool story on that front. But and the problem is, is these desalinization plants are coming back in and all these fields are going to be full unless there's we're working on a conservation plan, unless there's a, a way around it. And we may try to work with the agricultural field owners to like Drixel, Driscoll's is the uh, berries that we always buy. They're heavy, heavy down in that area. And so we're trying to work with them uh, on creating this checkerboard and keeping these fields fallow for X periods of time and allowing connectivity. Oh. But there's other issues of, um, of these wetlands going away. So we've also worked with the voles up in, um, up in the Sierra San Pedro Martir, where mm -hmm. up at the peak of the Martir is a, um, uh, a rare vole that hadn't been seen in, I don't know, 20, 30 years, something like that as, no, 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 I'm sorry, 100 years, I think. Uh, we caught it, you know, maybe five, six years ago, uh, but this is an area heavily impacted by livestock. And so these voles love these true wetlands, you know, these waterways with tall grasses and, and you know, you put a few hundred head of cattle up in these meadows and they're just trashed. And so um, one year they had an issue with, um, some type of disease with the cattle and they weren't allowed to bring them up there. And so the grasses came back. And again, these resilient rodents just <laughs> living on the edge came in and we caught a few. And so it was a great story. And we got a, a few papers out of it and I think we're gonna have more. So um, yeah, wetlands are a huge issue in, in Baja as they are here. Um, yeah. And so we're, we're you know working to understand it better and, and actually trying to uh, recreate what they were like in some areas. Yeah, well, you've, you've brought up the wetlands and that's a question that was just posed um, posted onto our onto our chat here and it's from Drew and, and Drew wants to know a little bit about the extinct, he put in quotes, uh, extinct mammal uh, that was discovered in or near the wetlands um, in Mexico. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, that, I think he's referring to, to that one? Um, either of those. Yeah, it's the San Quentin kangaroo rat most likely uh, applicable. So. And that was surrounding wetlands through all of San Quentin. So yeah, then it's a good story and it's a scary story. And hopefully we can uh, learn from what has happened in the past and uh, and uh, make some improvements so these animals can persist. Yeah. So talking a little bit, we're staying on the topic of specimens. Um, you know, back when you know pre-COVID time, when we can take tours and we could maybe have some behind the scenes looks into our collections. Is there one collection that stands out to you, Drew, where, you, where anyone would visit or anyone want to see the collection that we have and you immediately say, okay, this is my, my go-to. This is my favorite specimen that I like to highlight or show that we have in the museum. Um, do you have such a, a favorite, you know, and I'm going to put it lightly, favorite specimen uh, that we have uh, in our collection, Drew? You know, uh, Emily and I were just talking about this before we got on. I would love to do like, you know, once a month where we go through a group of animals at the museum because I have a favorite specimen in every aisle. Uh, so it's really hard to answer that question. But if it's somebody's first time seeing a collection um, and, and they need a photo opportunity, it's usually the narwhal tusk. So... It's a, it's a whale, massive. it's a whale. Yeah, you know, it's six feet long and uh, it's really beautiful and it's uh, it's an experience. I mean, it's it's better than holding a, an elephant tusk in my yeah. terms, but yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting specimen. Uh, one of the questions that we always like to ask uh, whenever we have uh, someone joining us for the memory meetup is uh, kind of like, yes, we, we talked a little bit about how you got involved and, and, and made your way into the museum, but it was there you know, in your earliest memories, was there a time where a lot of times uh, there's uh, a theory that you have a, a significant life event that says, yes, I want to dedicate my life to, you know, conservation, or I want to dedicate my life to this important work. Is there anything that you can remember that really triggered that early on, Scott? 
you know, I'm going to sort of answer this question because I had an epiphany moment once um, when I was still working at the zoo and I was living at the beach and I was volunteering at the museum. And it was a day, it was a weekday. And um, I went for a swim in the ocean. I was the only person on the beach. I think it was Pacific Beach or Mission Beach. And I, I just said, I'm gonna play hooky today from the museum. I'm, I'm gonna go for a swim and just hang out. And you know, I'm not gonna go in. I sat there and I, I still remember this. It was, it was very deeply ingrained in my head. And I just looked at my, you know, I just said, what are you doing with your life, Scott? This is not, <laughs> this isn't going to do anything for you. It's not going to get you anywhere. And it's not, you know, I, it was just a complete loss of passion, you know, and it, and, and I got up and I never made that mistake again. And so, yeah, so I'm not sure if I answered your question, but, you know, I think over time it developed while I was at the zoo that my conservation, um, efforts are better set here at the museum where um, I'm working with more wild um, native animals and uh, which needs just as much or sometimes more protection than a lot of this worldwide stuff that the zoo is doing. Yeah, um, and you, you kind of talk a little bit, you, you brought up your career and um, it, it, my next question, similar to, to something that, that was just asked right now too, is that you know, how, what was the, the role of a mentors or, you know, did mentors play an important role in your career? Uh, and if there is, if so, is there anyone that stands out as someone that, that, that helped you along the way and really kind of helped guide you or, or support you in your, in your career? Um, absolutely. Um, and there were several along the way. Um, you, you know, we all, it, it, and I take that role seriously. And so I always help students along the way in, in some capacity. We've had a lot of graduate students come through our lab um, that are now professors, uh, professional PhDs somewhere. Um, a lot of that has come through our lab and I'm really proud of that. But I have, um, the, the easiest one who many already know is Phil Unit. He's, he's um, you know, a big brain person and, um, I'm the guy that's good at catching animals and I'm good at observing and I, uh, he, he helps and has, has really guided me along my way with his career. And, uh, even though he's like only eight years older than me, he's still, uh, a huge part of my success. I easily can attribute, you know, the majority of my success to him and being around him and asking questions. So we, we, bounce things off each other all the time. And there's always something I come back with that I have to think more on and, and, uh, and, and, and act upon. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. And I, I, I hear uh, Phil Unit's name used quite a, quite a bit of, uh, when, as I'm working my way through the member meetups as well. Uh, but you know, recently we, in, where we're at the times of, uh, of COVID and the pandemic, it, it's kind of hard to talk about any, anything and, and working schedules, uh, yours really hasn't shifted. Like you said, you've been always traveling a lot. And uh, but is there a silver lining to what has you know what has shifted because of the pandemic, or or, or is there a silver lining that you see for for the department or you personally, Scott? Okay, yeah. I mean, there's many answers to this question. Strangely, um, you would assume that the environment would lose funding in in during the pandemic but it has not so you know we're very fortunate um i've kind of shifted a little bit i've gone from a lot of grant research work to a lot of contract work this last year because it's very high paying and it helps keep the museum afloat and you know you know definitely it's not easy to keep a nonprofit afloat during these these hard times especially when the doors aren't open and so that has been one of my roles. The silver lining is, is you know, being able to bring in funds um, due to my specialty. There's a huge demand for my specialty and that's working with small mammals. And so, um, yeah, no, it, it, there's, there's many silver linings and the animals, uh, there's not a lot of people out the in outdoors as much as um, there had been previously. So I'm finding access to a lot of areas is a lot easier. Um, so yeah, there's many answers to this question. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for the, for the, for life after, or once we're, we're, we're out and it's post COVID time, uh, is, is there, 
a wish list. I, I know when we've uh, we've stumbled upon this question uh, recently, where in in our departments, there's a wish list of what they want to either get into into their collections, obtain in their into their collections, or is there a project that you're that you're hoping for? You know, that's on your wish list, high on, high on the list for you, Scott, and, and and your department as far as either a specimen or a project that you want to get involved with that that, that you're looking forward to. Uh, you know, in, in the near future. So, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, again, <laughs> we could have this talk for hours and hours. <laughs> um, you know, over the last five, 10 years, we've taken in a few whales and I've been proud of that. Um, and so we took on one from uh, uh, a humpback from the tip of Point Loma and it got a lot of media coverage. Um, we took also another humpback off of the, um, shore of um, Camp Pendleton. Um, but I'm, we also took a Brutus whale in um, uh, that came into San Diego Bay and was, was deceased. Uh, I'm really hoping to take in a, uh, an entire gray whale. That's, wow. that's on our list. That's on my list. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, Tom Demeray who publishes often. Uh, and I'm not a marine mammologist at all, but I, I think it's something that our collections really need. Uh, and honestly, space-wise, that's about the only other large thing we can handle is just <laughs> one of those and then we're done. No sperm whales or blue whales allowed. <laughs> a gray yeah. whale, yes. <laughs> um, but projects, you know, my head is always spinning on fun new projects lately. Um, we just published, if you haven't seen it, uh, a paper in Science, the journal Science, um, just in the last uh, week and a half, and that got a, a lot of press. Um, it, you know, it's a climate change, uh, a mm -hmm. bird and mammal response comparison, and it was a very good paper. And it's already getting a lot of um, of positive feedback, and it's already getting citations on new papers. So it, it's really having its positive effect. And that was years of work done in the Mojave and Joshua Tree uh, for both birds and mammals. It was more of a mammal mammal uh, mammal work, but. Um, but what came out of it is uh, essentially mammals have persisted over the last uh, 80 years. There's been really little impacts to the communities because mammals burrow, they go underground, they stay deep under, they can avoid the, the change in temperatures, whereas uh, the birds are exposed. Um, and so uh, I also, um, this is related, but I also work with the Pacific pocket mouse an endangered rodent up on Camp Pendleton and Dana Point, where um, for management reasons, we have no idea on the depth of these burrows and how they're impacted by foot traffic mm. or, or even road traffic, you know, dirt roads driving over, dirt. there's no information. And so uh, my new big project that I'm trying to push is a burrow study, you know, and, and, and so we did some casting of some burrows, uh, Pacific pocket mouse burrows last summer, but I wanna do it across many taxa so you know many different types of rodents or or even small carnivores it's just you know in just having a baseline so perhaps 50 years from now somebody would revisit that work and find that these animals are digging deeper because the temperatures have increased or wow. or, or who knows what the reaction might be it's just yeah. we have no baseline and, and strangely there's been little to no work done on burrow depths and complexities ever. So I'm, I'm excited to push on that one. That's my next big, big project. And that could be, you know, years in the making to, yeah. to make it happen. So. Well, Scott, if you can believe it, our, our, our time is up. We definitely no, appreciate already? having, I know I can, I have all these other questions that I wanted to, you know, start asking because you, you, you led me down this other train of thought, but, oh, everyone that's joining us today. Thank you so much for, for, for your, for your time, Scott, we, we appreciate you. Uh, here joining us. We're going to turn this over back to Emily. She has a few uh, updates to share with everyone of a couple other virtual events that are coming up. But Scott, thank you again. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.